Hello, and welcome to this week's Movie Math, where, whoo, what a show, my God. And it all stems from the Snyderverse. Hold on, let me explain. See, first there was the success of some fans and a lot of the media in taking those movies down by relentlessly and mercilessly mocking them. I saw some people this weekend in the media uh, and other areas express that they felt they knew what was best for filmdom and it was their responsibility to shut down this kind of garbage. Uh, garbage. Uh, so that's one take. But then... It's being used on the other side by some fans who, of course, were able to get the Snyder Cut eventually released to bring it roaring back to life. And then, based on that success, they're currently waging another brutal, this time, well, as brutal as the one that took it down, a brutal campaign against current DC movies to get the Snyderverse back permanently. Bottom line, it's ugly out there. So many of you are quick to argue that social media isn't real life. Well, it can have real world consequences and Hollywood is quite aware of this. From 2016 blo uh, Ghostbusters to Star Wars to the Snyderverse and now current DCEU movies to now Morbius. I mean, wow, it's really spreading. Last year, Bob Iger gave a fascinating interview and a lot of people didn't notice probably the most important thing that he said. And he said if he was going to invest in anything, he would consider investing or trying to get a job in the next big technological advancement, which would be to uh, filter the internet, to, uh, he said, filter what people are able to say, but I would also wager it would maybe take away internet anonymity. Uh, as I always tell you, money drives everything. Money, money, money. That's what it is. That drives every, you know, what, you know, altruists, you know, altruistic thing that Hollywood does. It's because they think they can make a buck doing it. And that's why the internet has been able to run free with so little oversight. It was generating huge amounts of revenue and free publicity. But when the internet starts to hurt companies' ability to make money, well, business finds a way. I mean, there's no more dislike button, right? Well, at least you can't see it. Uh, so as you, so to you rage monsters out there, go to town, enjoy it, but just realize that with Iger's comments, and Iger is a very smart guy who really has his finger on the pulse of what's going on, particularly in Hollywood, the future, that future that I just described is already clearly being worked on. People must be working on that technology for him to, to not only know about it, but to feel confident enough to put it in an interview. He wants to be able to look back and say, see, I told you. Uh, I mean, you're just making that future get here faster. All right, let's get back to today, which is pretty freaking bleak too. So Morbius, well, let's just look at the facts. Uh, a lot of you like to put all this emotional, personal drama, and you think people or myself gets offended. I don't care. As I've told you before, I'm fascinated in the business, the drama of what's happening. I have no horse, horse in this race. So you're just projecting your own things on me. So whatever. All right, so anyway, Morbius does have a very low Rotten Tomatoes critic score of 17%, but it's around 70% on the audience score, and that's actually gone up over the past few days with 2.5 thousand verified ratings. Some of you swore it would go down the more that were added. Now, this of course, we'll talk about the cinema score, which is bad. Don't worry about it. But, and as I've said many times before, the Rotten Tomatoes audience score, even with the verified situation, can be manipulated. That of also was a fix to try and take care of trolls. So you see, um, it's already happening. Uh, but it can still be tinkered with. I wouldn't, you know, I would take that with a grain of salt. But considering how horrible people have been to Morbius, you would think that the trolls who are trying to downvote it would overwhelm anyone trying to upvote it, you know, if there were any bad actors in that regard. So the fact that it's at 70, that in and of itself is an achievement. I mean, that's amazing. I mean, I'm not going to die on a hill for Morbius, and I don't really think anybody would. You know I thought it was a pretty good movie. I think what's happening is that, you know, I don't think that anybody, even anyone who enjoyed Morbius, would say it was more than a B. Not even a B+. Plus. But I think the shocking hate for the film and the fact that, you know, it wasn't that bad is kind of like made some people try to stand up for it. You know, like, stop kicking it. It's already dead. Like, it's not that bad. Like, if, we're, if you're going to, you know... I guess it's a matter of opinion, right? But I mean, you should at least respect that some people have the opinion that it's not that bad. But 
It just seems unfair. Uh, the Hollywood Reporter even ran an article about that. And for the Hollywood Reporter to run that article, uh, that means that not only did a writer pitch it, but that an editor and the editor above that approved it. And so they felt that was uh, a valid take. And the trades don't like to get in on these kind of arguments. You know, it's not like it was one of like a, you know, like um, one of the, you know, other sites that cover entertainment. So, I mean, it's a pretty big deal for a trade to run that article. Now, Sony, I'm sure, is like, what the f we just released one of the most beloved films of all time. The, and that was great because it didn't seem like an MCU movie. I know a lot of you like to be like, well, that's because the MCU helped with that. And I'm sure that Kevin Feige did contribute. But let's not forget that one of the main things that people were excited about was the return of characters from two other Spider-Man franchises that were made solely by Sony and that everybody loved and had very good memories of. Uh, plus, they made Uncharted work this year, Mitchells vs. the Machines, which has been a very strong contender during the awards season. And speaking of animation, what about the Spider-Verse movies that not only had no input from the MCU, but in fact inspired No Way Home? Uh, Spider-Verse, Sony uh, did it first internally. I mean, they're not even involved in all the streaming drama, so they're like, how did we get sucked into this? Back to Morbius, to be fair, again, it did get a, a C-plus cinema score, and that's real bad. That's a very bad cinema score. So how could that have happened, right? I mean, some people do like the movie, but I think that the people who, I would, are, I would, I think the people who really like the movie are like comic book fans who don't have an ax to grind with anybody, like myself, who, again, don't have a horse in this race, and are like, yeah, you know what? I judged it at face value, and it was entertaining. Uh, as I said, it was like Daybreakers. Um, and then also, I think maybe people who are fans of Jared Leto. I've also seen some, speaking of the Snyderverse, some Snyderverse people really supporting the film because of Jared Leto's involvement and his own campaigning and support for the Snyder Cut, uh, which he, of course, was involved in. Uh, so, but mainstream, speaking of not having a horse in this race, the mainstream moviegoer who's not on social media and just goes to the movies, because Morbius did okay. Um, why would they, what, what, what would make them give this a bad score? And they don't care about building a Spider-Verse and what Sony's doing. I think it might be Jared Leto. He might just not click with mainstream moviegoers. I think they, they, and they might, just might not like him. It happens. You know, we've talked about, for instance, uh, Ryan Gosling, a delightful actor. I love him. I actually think Jared Leto's pretty good. Uh, sometimes he goes too far, but I think he can deliver some really good performances. Uh, but, you know, and some people, Jared Leto does have his fans, but he just doesn't have enough. He just doesn't have enough. You know, there will be stands online for certain actors and talent, and it's like, well, that's great, and you can maybe some, I mean, it, I always find it interesting, because I'm like, are you not going to see this person's movie? That might be the case. I mean, we know a lot of people who are on social media who walk the walk, but don't, uh, I mean, who talk the talk, but don't walk the walk. So... That could be an issue. It's, it's fascinating. But I, I would wager that it might be Jared Leto. And that if I were Disney, that would give me pause, serious pause about having him lead up my Tron movie. Because uh, that's going to be a lot more expensive than Morbius was. Morbius was actually not a very expensive movie. Which means Jared Leto works cheap. All right, so anyway, Sony will never sell the rights of the Spider, for the Spider-Verse back to Disney, which I know is the goal of some of you. Never going to happen. Which is why Disney agreed to this unprecedented shotgun marriage between Foggy and Pascal. Uh, but some of you argue that just maybe, just maybe, you can at least get Sony to stop making crap. And you know, again, to be fair, many of you did get Ghostbusters to seriously pivot and Star Wars to take a break from their movies. That's extraordinary, considering they were making like a billion dollars a piece with the exception for Solo. Uh, but with Venom, and even the lesser Venom 2, making so much money at the box office, and even Morbius doing okay. These numbers are not horrible. It's dropping at an alarming rate day to day. It was very strong out of the gate, but now it's fallen like an injured bat out of the sky. But again, it was inexpensive to make, uh, especially for a comic book movie. Uh, and I think that, you know, Morbius could do quite well in the ancillary market where when the heat dies down and people begrudgingly or secretly admit it's not that bad. You know, no one's going to know if you watch Morbius on a plane or in a hotel room, right? I mean, that can just be your dirty little secret, um, which is hilarious. So, but Sony will be the one who laughs all the way to the bank. And so that's why I think, you know, these Sony's movies are, are not doing so bad. Craven is already casting and getting, and in the case of Venom, doing extraordinarily well. Craven is already casting and getting ready to roll camera, while Madam Web is also quickly taking shape.
So I see more with Sony's Spider-Verse, I see more of a deadlock like with DC developing, where these movies keep coming out and everyone from fans to the media to studio to talent is just miserable. Aw, oh, man. But they are still bright spots, right? Like the Batman. And I think that benefits from not being part of the DCEU being its own thing. I still think that Warner Brothers would be, it would be very beneficial for them just to stop in their, dead in their tracks and move on just from the Batman and build from there. You can do different tones for different characters in different movies. I think it would work. In its fifth weekend, the Batman has now earned $349 million domestic, passing Joker and Batman v Superman. And it's also passed $700 million globally. Some in the industry are even like, hey, maybe it'll make it to $400 million domestic, which would be incredible. I don't know if it'll ever make it to $400 million because its 45-day window is closing, or it's a theatrical exclusive. Only two more weekends where it's theaters only, and then it hits HBO Max on April 19th. Could Warner Brothers decide to move that? They have not officially announced it. It leaked. They could move it if they wanted to. Hmm, fascinating. Let's see what they decide to do. It would be pretty nice if it could get to if it could get to 400 million. I think it would need maybe another month to be able to get another 50 million domestic. What do you think? I think, you know, all the way until Doctor Strange 2 comes out. That sounds pretty good to me. But they did promise that it would be 45-day window for all their 2022 movies. So, they're in a bit of a pickle. Uh, stop making promises Warner Brothers, HBO Max. Uh, they're like, we'll see. That's what Disney does. Anyway, its domestic haul is so strong, regardless of if it gets to 400 million. Right now, it's strong enough that Warner Brothers can reasonably argue and tell themselves that its overseas box office has been hurt by the war in Ukraine and COVID, which is what kept it from getting a billion. That's what I'd argue if I was a Warner Brothers executive and even a Discovery executive. As for the rest of the box office, The Lost City fell 51% in its second weekend. Solid, but not great for a rom-com. It would have been better to have a drop in the 40s the 40th percentile. That's usually where rom-coms are. Crazy Rich Asians was such a sensation. It dropped just about 7% in its second weekend, but we can't expect that for every rom romantic comedy. Trainwreck, which I said was also a recent, one, of the, one of the only recent few successful rom-coms held in the 40s. Uh, but no worries. This is another movie that I think will do fantastic in the ancillary market, and it still had a great opening. Unfortunately, RRR fell more than 70% in its second weekend. Remember last weekend we were talking about overseas films opening big in the United States or the North American box office these days, but still falling around 70% in their second weekends. Well, RRR fell a shocking 83%. Yikes. You know, the reason international content has done so well on streaming, Netflix in particular, is that there is a dub option. I know, blasphemous, but let's put our business hats on. Hollywood films are played overseas and made available both subtitled and dubbed, so other countries are watching our movie subtitled. And then also, again, it's found so much success on streaming. So perhaps international films should have some showings here that are dubbed as well. And it would create a whole new industry for voice talent to work on those movies. So I think I would try it. And Everything Everywhere All at Once added 28, just 28 theaters this weekend, but got into the top 10 as it gets ready to go wide this coming weekend. It continues to have an incredible per theater average, the kind we used to see for hot indies before the pandemic. How high can it get next weekend? I am very curious to see. Over on streaming, we'll start with Nielsen as always for the final week of February. Netflix dominating with Inventing Anna, Moving back up to number one. Not a lot happening this week in the, in the streaming space. Uh, and I also think that's the benefit of a ton of episodes for Inventing Anna. Who, I, I like took a break midway and then went back to it. What did you do? I think that might be one of the reasons it popped back up. Uh, and, then we'll, uh, and then Amazon's uh, Mrs. Maisel and Reacher are still holding strong in the top 10. Uh, Maisel is a weekly release, two episodes a week, but Reacher is even more impressive because that was a whole season drop and it's still really doing well. Uh, Hulu's, speaking of drop, Hulu's The Dropout debuted at number 10 with the first three episodes, just like Pam and Tommy when it debuted its first three episodes. But like Pam and Tommy, will it never be seen in the top 10 again? You know, maybe they should do three or two a week as well. Maybe one a week is not a good idea. Uh, Hulu needs to work on getting on this chart more. Uh, Nine Perfect Strangers is, I think, the only time they really were able to place. That's too, and that was a pretty good show. That's too bad. That's crazy. And HBO Max uh, and Apple TV can be in here. Apple TV, they have, so, uh, Apple TV has some of the most amazing content I've ever seen. It's incredible. They're up there with like HBO. HBO, it's amazing. And uh, it's, it's, you know, just not enough people are getting it. 
I agree with many of you that you should either be able to get it for a subscription price or they should make it available to rent a la carte on uh, iTunes, uh, both the movies and the TV shows. Uh, cause like a lot of people didn't see Coda, the best picture winner, because it's only available on the service. Fascinating. All right. So anyway, and Disney plus didn't even make it into the top 10 streaming shows that week. That's, that's crazy as Boba Fett finally fell out. Uh, but they're still dominating the movie chart with Encanto, although it, it is losing some steam finally for the, for the first time dropping under a billion minutes, uh, viewed for the week. And then Free Guy's still doing well, and West Side Story did pretty well on the service when it debuted that week and m managed to place in the middle of the pack. Over on Netflix for just last week, uh, Ryan Reynolds and Grant Gustin are still number one and two with Windfall doing okay. That actually also moved up from number seven last week to number four this week, as I guess people remembered to circle back and catch that. Uh, did you watch Windfall? What made you go back and watch it? Not the weekend it dropped. And wow, look at Bridgerton with its debut weekend. It's got almost four times the amount of views as runner-up Is It Cake itself, a surprise hit on Netflix. But wow, Bridgerton, what a juggernaut. Uh, but as back to Is It Cake, never give up because Mikey Day might have been the co-writer on Home Sweet Home Alone. Whoa. And also has not really ha got any work outside of SNL, but here he is hosting this juggernaut, which has a lot of SNL actors on it. I thought maybe it was produced by Lauren Michaels, but it's not, which is interesting. Maybe Mikey, De he's not, I don't think he's a producer on it though. I don't know how they got all those SNL people on there. Anyway, on iTunes, well, Spider-Man No Way Home is of course still number one. Hey, look, here are some very poorly received movies from the theater doing quite well on streaming. So this could be a future Morbius. Now, there's also The Contractor, which failed to open in the top 10 this weekend. It got to number 13 with just about half a million. But here it's doing pretty good. It's in like, like number four. Uh, as for what's coming out this week, we've got an old-fashioned pre-pandemic weekend at the Multiplex with a variety of movies opening. There's Family Flick, Sonic the Hedgehog 2, which actually, I believe, starts showing on Wednesday. They have some sneak peeks for fans. Uh, Michael Bay is late. They can roll that all into Friday, I believe, and that should help them at the box office for the weekend frame. Cheating, but hey, it's allowed. If it's allowed, I guess it's allowed. Uh, Michael Bay's latest Ambulance, which he has been the harshest critic of so far. Uh, that's crazy. And again, everything everywhere all at once goes wide. Not super wide, but wide enough to do some damage. A little over a thousand theaters or screens, screens. Uh, the Grammys are tonight live from Las Vegas, although how can they hope to compete with the accidental drama of last Sunday's Oscars? But will people tune in thinking something similar might happen? We'll see. Uh, and on streaming on Thursday, HBO Max debuts Tokyo Vice from Michael Mann, starring Ansel Elgort and Ken Watanabe, and Close Enough. While on Friday, there's uh, the debut of season two of iCarly on Paramount+, Plus, season five of Elite on Netflix, and a Black Lady sketch show returns on HBO at 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, and that's when it will also become available on HBO Max. Uh, so that's this week's movie math. What have you been watching? What do you plan to watch? And what are your thoughts on the Morbius situation? Uh, the movie and beyond the movie. Uh, I guess the current state of Hollywood? craziness. Share those thoughts down below, subscribe today, and of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.